For those of you who do not know me, I joined the team here in New Westminster exactly one year today. Uh, just hours after the Westminster Pier fire, I bring with me over 12 years of municipal finance experience and currently oversee our financial services department, which includes our front counter billing and collections team, our procurement team, and our financial planning and reporting team. It is very exciting and inspiring to have public engaged in the budget process as we continue to build a livable community that serves all. Next slide, please. In today's presentation, Lorraine and I will walk you through how the city's finances work at a 101 level. Specifically, we will go over the financial sustainability principles, council priorities, core services, emerging priorities, the difference between the operating versus the capital budgets, different sources that fund city services and council priorities, our operating expense allocation by major service area. We'll also cover about the 2021 total property tax levied and some 101 around the key drivers around property taxes specifically. And then we'll end off with the five-year capital plan allocation. Next slide, please, thank you. So when setting the city's budgets, we are guided by our city's financial sustainability principles. The sustainable principle with a city of our age and with significant financial challenges imposed by the pandemic, this principle helps us focus on our core services and duty to maintain our assets through reasonable rate hikes. The adaptable principle, we saw this in 2020 when faced with the unexpected event, the COVID-19 pandemic, and we needed to adjust and adapt quickly on our spends. We responded, accelerated spends in support in some areas while we ramped down in other areas. Stable, predictability of city's revenue sources, less reliance on external or variable revenue sources. The strength of this principle really holds true when revenue such as gaming, parking, and other fee type revenues become vulnerable, like, like they did during the pandemic. The city could continue to maintain our core services as it relies heavily on taxes and utility rate payers. Accountable. This principle is aligned to everything we see happening around the world on equity, inclusion, diversity, anti-racism. When serving a city, there's so many different services and different needs of a diverse population. We must be fiscally prudent and consider the best interests of all, no matter gender, color, race, health, financial position, or age, etc. Next slide, please. So I'd like to spend some time here to align with you as a larger organization on the many priorities. So from a climate priority, we need to continue to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. How do we do this, you ask? Well, we need to walk the talk and align our money to either new infrastructure or incentives that help change behavior. Bold steps over the next decade and beyond include investments in sustainable transportation to reduce the number of cars on the road, plus an investment in electronic infra electric infrastructure to support the vehicles that need to stay on the roads. Other investments include increase in biodiversity, simply stated as trees, and energy efficient buildings. Climate emergency, as you all know, is at a global level. So we are definitely not an island of our own over here in New Westminster. Similarly to that is the demand for more housing, specifically affordable and supportive housing for our most vulnerable populations, along with continued investments towards truth and reconciliation while we maintain our core services and manage through emerging priorities such as COVID-19 pandemic, extreme weather events, overdose crisis, homelessness, supply chain disruptions specific to inflation, and the list could go on. Next slide, thank you. Uh, difference between the capital and the operating budgets. So the key difference here is that the operating budget, I mean, the capital budget focuses on renewing and rebuilding our existing assets while planning for growth and future generational usage. And the operating budget maintains those assets while serving and protecting the public. So quick snapshot. So on the right is fire services, library services, parks. Obviously there's more services, police and, and, um, and general government services across the city. On the left side is our capital replacing and renewing. So it's an underground infrastructure. Uh, and then above ground is the Canada Games uh, replacement of key infrastructure. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to hand over the slide to Lorraine Lau, our Manager of Financial Services, to go into more details around the operating budgets and key services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harji, and good evening to the participants. <clears throat> I'm excited to be here again for our second webinar on the budget. Um, starting with the sources of funding for the city budgets and where does the money come from? The city has a number of funding sources. The most significant are property taxes that are levied annually to property, all property owners and utility rates which are billed to the users. Each of these uh, segments represents 39% of the city's funding sources. Other revenue per the graph that you can see there, other revenue at 6% includes permits such as those issued for building or plumbing, licenses like animal filming or business licenses, digital signage fees, so those nice big signs we have, and investment income. Sales and services at 5% includes fees for programs and events, primarily in parks and recreation and the Anvil Center, as well as revenue from parking. Grants and contributions, which are 11% of the 2021 budgeted funds, includes grants from senior levels of government and contributions from various organizations like TransLink. Then we have developers who contribute to city um, funding uh, for amenities when they're building major three major developments. And we have revenue that comes in from casino operation. Next slide, please. As Harji noted in the, operating, in the operating budget, we are focused on the provision of services. The city's operations are divided into two main streams. The utility funds, which total just over 67 million of an annual budget, covers electrical, water, sewer, and solid waste operations. The general fund, which is on the, the other side of this slide, has a total operating budget of about $137 million and includes various departments like fire and police for 51 million, engineering for 28 million, parks, recreation, and library for 26 million and all other functions, including permitting and all support services for 32 million. The mix of operating expenses in the service areas will vary depending on the function of the departments. For the city overall, um, staffing costs are the largest operating expense at 42% of the total. We are a service industry and we depend on our people to provide those services. Utility purchases, which are only incurred by the four utility operations, are at 22%. Contracted services, materials and supplies, and insurance are 10% of the budget. In the operating expenses, we also include depreciation of assets over their useful life, and that accounts for 10% of the 2021 operating expenses. Debt servicing costs for the 2021 budget are 1% of the total and contributions to reserves that fund future projects are 14%. Next slide. I will shift now to some information specific to property taxes. An important aspect of the property taxes that are levied by the city is that not all of these uh, funds are for the city. In 2021, 36% or 51 million of the taxes collected by the city were for other taxing authorities. It's a large portion of the tax bill that you see when you receive it. Um, the largest amount, which is about $40 million of the 143 million that we bill is for the provincial school tax. The other parties that we collect for and remit to are the Greater Vancouver Transit Authority, the Greater Vancouver Regional District, the Municipal Finance Authority, BC Assessment, and the Business Improvement Associations. So back to Harji for some more insight into property taxes and then the capital budget. Thank you, Lorraine. So from property tax drivers really start with BC Assessment setting land assessment values, which are based on re recent market sales, for residents and highest and best use for commercial building or industry owners. 
And the 92 million that tax levy from our previous slide is driven by City of New Westminster specific services, such as the police, fire, parks, libraries, and, and the balance is from the other tax authorities. Those are the key drivers. Well, next slide, please. City of New Westminster, so as I mentioned, each year annually, we'll start the budget process. So last year, we the budget property tax rate increase was 4.9%, collecting 92 million from city residents and, and commercial businesses uh, versus 89 million. The provincial, the province of the assessment um, will take this information from recent sales and send over the new assessed values to taxpayers in February. The impact, if your property assessment exceeds or is below the average for the class, you will see a proportional increase or decrease in gross taxes versus the stated tax rate increase. So you won't see 4.9%. You may be contacting our department to talk about why did my tax rates go up by 23%. So there's a lot of moving factors in the calculation and that includes what's happening with your neighborhood. The city will continue to work hard to keep the annual increases at reasonable levels However, market changes are difficult to manage and therefore making it difficult to maintain that predictability of the year-over-year -year change of one's tax bill. The capital plan, the five-year plan, um, is fairly ambitious. It's $470.8 million. And a key priority spending is on infrastructure and core services of $331.5 million, which includes major project TAC, or Canada Games, uh, 98 million, sewer separation and water mains at 75 million, and other engineering structures and roads worth 35, Massey Theatre investments, Queensboro substation, parks improvements, and automated meters. Environment, climate, and sustainable transportation makes up 106.5 million of that. Included in that plan is a new district energy operation, walking, cycling, and greenways, and citywide facilities, equipment, fleet, and system upgrades. The balance is coming from organizational effectiveness, 20 million, affordable housing, 9 million, culture and economy, uh, reconciliation, 3.5 million. Next slide, please. This slide is just really representing that ambitious capital plan and the amount of spending that's going on over 2021 to 2024. Big year for 2021 and 2022. Uh, originally, it would have been more spending in 2020, but with the COVID pandemic, it really did slow things down. Um, so we are picking up again. Next slide, please. Funding the five-year capital plan. So majority of the funds do come from the city's reserves for asset renewal and replacement. There has been a trigger for debt funding uh, as we embark on major infrastructure upgrade with our Canada Games Pool um, and, and also with District Energy. So. Definitely the, there are developer contributions, there's other uh, casino and digital signage revenue contributions and third party grants. The key message here is that although as we improve the city's assets and plan for growth, there is a draw on the reserves and there is a need to borrow. But as we do that, we're improving our asset condition. This may tr trigger a link between an increase in property taxes for debt servicing. Next slide, please. I'll hand it back to Lorraine to talk a little bit about the budget 2021, which was last year's engagement highlights. Thank you, Harji. One of the important components of the public engagement process for the 2021 budget was a community survey. We received over a thousand responses and the results were provided to council and to management so they could consider the community input as budgets were being developed. Here are some of the highlights from the survey results. On this slide, uh, respondents were asked in an open text question to identify the one priority for capital investments that was most important to them. The top three were maintain re or replace infrastructure, affordable housing and addressing homelessness, climate action and environment, environmental sustainability. This question was, um, the responses to this question was a multiple choice question and the respondents were asked to select three of the top issues in the city indicating, and they indicated that transportation, not just roads, but all types, including sidewalks and uh, greenways and cycling paths um, was top of mind. 
Uh, next was reliable infrastructure and affordability, um, rounded out the top three. Uh, homelessness, the opioid and the opioid epidemic, COVID-19 responses, including uh, recovery was next. And then uh, the climate, climate change and the environment uh, were sort of the next three. So um, lots of agreement on a number of the most issues that were in BC and New West at that time. And uh, we'll be interested to see how that may have changed. Next slide, please. One of the questions in the survey was about the preference uh, for property tax rates, considering the selected priorities for services, programs, and initiatives throughout the rest of the survey. The choices ranged from increasing taxes more than 5% uh, in order to substantially increase operations to the other end of the spectrum, which would decrease taxes and substantially decrease service levels. The results showed that 72% of the respondents were comfortable with some tax increase and 20% preferred no tax increase or a decrease. Next slide, please. And I'll go back to Harjeet. Thank you, Lorraine. So building the 2022 budget, uh, next slide, please. Essentially, we start early, uh, seek input throughout the process, post webinars such as today, um, and council workshops. Then we take the feedback, upholding our city's financial principles, council priorities, and aim to close off by December with a five-year financial plan, which includes the 2022 budget and annual rates. Next slide, please. And final note, um, we continue to do more. So we're, as an organization, we deal with the impacts of COVID-19 and all of the things we covered today in the slide through the budget com uh, conversations. We continue to look for other opportunities and beyond the tax rates and ratepayer increases, seek stimulus partnership funding opportunities uh, like carbon tax credits as well, strategic procurement strategies, efficiency, optimizing our capital and operating spend rate to increase capacity to do more throughout the plan, forecast and analyze, we understand our long-term long impact of our financial decisions and try to accelerate projects that have a positive return, healthy maintain our affordable levels of debt as percent of operating revenues versus reserve and set targets and maintaining appropriate and responsible taxes and utility rates that will support the planned expenditures. We wanna balance some growth related assets with growth related revenues through our development, review policies and control, balancing our service pressures and rising costs due to population growth. And now also with the supply chain disruption, the inflation. Reserves, we wanna to continue to build our reserves that are resilient to climate change and natural disasters. I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa Spitali, our Chief Administrative Officer, to talk about some of the challenges and our climate and equity goals. Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us tonight. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to end by reminding everyone why we're here and, and how we got here. Uh, so about four years ago, we, no, sorry, you stay on the next one first, I'm just gonna pre preamble. We started about four years ago talking to all of you about how to make the budget process more transparent. And your feedback was quite clear. Um, quite frankly, we weren't doing a very good job. We weren't doing a very good job of, of demystifying the budget process. We weren't doing a very good job of, of articulating uh, what are the decision-making drivers that go into the budget. And so what we've been trying to do over the, the last four years is bit by bit, um, trying to provide, I think, better information, more transparent information, and information that really shows how decisions are made during the budget process. In order to do that, we started talking more, um, we started talking about creating a robust framework around the budget process. Many of you were saying to us that it didn't make sense why, why do some initiatives go forward, others do not? Um, why is an initiative important? one isn't as important. So the frameworks have helped us do that. Um, and we created two frameworks. Um, one is the climate framework. And we did that, We uh, council approved that a year before COVID. And it was really looking at climate decisions and then how we articulate that in the budget process. And then last year, 
mainly because of the work we we're doing with COVID, we started talking about equity as well. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of that just to round out this discussion before we go into your questions. Next slide, please. Climate action as a budget framework. So you'll hear us um, use the term, we are what we spend. So quite frankly, as government and as a service provider, um, we provide you with services. Um, where we allocate those services is really your, your tax dollars. Based on the information you were giving us and the feedback that we needed to demystify the budget process, we needed to a, have a framework that really talked a lot about the capital program and then another that spoke more to the operating budget as well. So climate action in particular really is around the, the capital budget. So um, many of you know our seven bold steps. Council approved that in 2019. And what council said was, let's use climate action as a city lens. So in, you know, in simple terms, where's the greenest bang for our buck? So when we look at that, you know, what does that mean? Departments bring forward their, their capital budgets, their capital submissions. Clearly the submissions are more than we can afford to do in any given year. But then how do we prioritize that? And, and in the case of the capital budget it has a lot to do with alignment around climate action. So on the bottom, bottom left are just two um, examples of the type of metrics that we look at when we bring forward projects in the capital program. The first one is around bold step number one, which is a carbon free corporation. And so Harji mentioned sort of the city's corporate greenhouse gas response. A good example of that is our Saffron District Energy project. So a project of roughly $60 million when we're looking at, at build out will also address 60% of the city's corporate GHG emissions. That's what we mean when we start looking at alignment between climate action and our spending. Another bold step was around creating a robust urban forest. Again, number of trees planted in the community, retention of mature trees in the community, looking at a robust canopy, all are ways that we're looking at some small actions and larger actions to deal with climate action. That's the first one. Next slide, please. The second one is the equity framework. So this graphic is a really good example. Uh, we, we typically ask ourselves, what's the difference between equality and equity? This illustration probably does it better than um, most explanations, really showing the difference between why we are trying to seek equity. Equity became very pronounced during our, our COVID response. Um, there was a recognition around the world that the most vulnerable were the most impacted by COVID. That, and then when you're a government and a service provider, how do we ensure that we're really addressing the needs of, of, the, of the communities most vulnerable? So all throughout COVID, City Council said that we had to prioritize our COVID response. And so you saw that in the work we were doing with, with seniors, um, the homeless, um, looking at what was happening also in the business community and how people were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. That created, um, that helped us sort of create um, a more robust framework called the DEER framework, which is diversity, equity, inclusion and anti-racism. So we'll be working on that for the next two years. But in the interim, we've also have created an equity framework that we're actually using right now during this budget process. And again, it has a real alignment in particular with the operating budget. And the reason I say that is, in essence, it helps frame what we as city staff are doing with our time. Not so much the projects, but what we're doing with our time on program delivery working on various policy initiatives and how we're trying to deal with some of the responses in the community. Bottom left, just a couple examples. One is looking at changes to the city's procurement practices. Again, it's part of our COVID response and recovery efforts, really looking at trying to prioritize the use of city contracts within the local economy. As one example of how we try to use city, the city's purchasing power and trying to retain that money into the local economy as a way to continue with generating economic activity. 
And the next one, and we've talked about it a lot, and we actually had a lot of feedback about this last year, was the city's advocacy, support, and requirements around housing equity, protecting renters, providing affordable rental housing choices, addressing homelessness, and providing housing choices to an array of incomes in the community. What we're doing here is by creating an equity framework, it is helping us then look at the operating budget and aligning that with the programs that really are, are driving in many response, really um, in many requests, the COVID response and recovery efforts in our community. And with that, I'm going to now turn it back to Jennifer, um, who's gonna now take us to, oh, no, I'm not. See, that's what I have when I don't remember my own slides. Okay. So now I'm gonna just give you a, a quick impact, a uh, quick discussion about just a reminder of summer COVID. Now I'm not gonna, I've gone through a lot of this, but what I'm probably gonna say on a personal note is um, I, I have not been, I am not mentally prepared for the fourth wave. And I say that freely and as a recognition, I think of some of the mental health challenges that we've all been feeling. And in particular, um, emergency services uh, colleagues. This has been difficult. And I think for many of us, we actually thought we were gonna go into more recovery than we are right now. So it certainly is having an impact. We outline what they are, but you've heard us talk about this for the last two years. Um, but from a budget perspective, it, it does affect revenue. So that's what I'm gonna say about that one. And now truly now my last slide is maybe a bit on, on, on the positive. There's an unprecedented amount of stimulus funding right now from senior levels of government. Many of it is tied to, to COVID uh, recovery. We are applying for millions of dollars in funding in an array of projects throughout our, our capital program and many of, an, of our sort of operating budget enhancements as well. We've been successful on some um, and others um, haven't been successful at, to the extent that we were hoping um, in particular with our Thomas Out project, the Canada Games replacement project. We are hoping for more funding there. We're gonna continue to try wherever we can, but we have had successes like with biodiversity and others. So again, it all helps. And as Harji mentioned and Lorraine mentioned, like we have an aggressive capital program. And because we're aligning as much of this as up with opportunities from senior funding, it does have an accelerated expectation on our on our timelines. We are seeing some some pluses. Um, we've been told by the casino that we can expect some some gaming revenue at pre-pandemic levels. Um, Parks and Recreation are letting us know that um, we've had some very positive response with our new programming. Development activity is increasing as well. We we want to um, identify that because development activity has a special sort of revenue driver in the budget under new construction. So we always we always monitor that quite 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 closely that way. So happy to see that the activity is increasing again. And again, these are all key revenue drivers for the budget. So that does have some positive impacts. Now I'm finally am now going to turn it over to Jennifer. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Lisa, Harji, and Lorraine for the presentation. Um, and we've got some questions coming in. So um, I'm going to get to those right away. I just want to remind everyone who's on the, the webinar um, how to look at the questions that are coming in and how to add your own. So you want to look for the Q&A icon in your Zoom menu. Um, you can click that. It's going to open up a separate box and you can type your questions in there. You should also be able to see the questions that, you, that others who are on the webinar are putting in, and you can click the little thumbs up button underneath those questions, and that bumps some questions up to the top of the list. It helps us to know, you know, multiple people have this question, and that's the order that I'll be reading out your questions. Um, so if you have any trouble at all, you can send us a note in chat, or in the question and answer, we'll try to help you out. You can also um, use the raise hand button um, to let us know that you want to ask a question by voice um, and we'll, we can unmute you and, um, and have you ask a question directly to our panel. All right, so I'm gonna jump right in here and I see people have found the like button because we've got questions moving around in the list. So our first one is by Karen. Thanks for the question, Karen. I am grateful that our city has declared a climate emergency. 
what strategies does the city have for influencing our citizens to align their tax spending priorities with the climate emergency, demonstrating an understanding that nothing else will matter if we don't reduce our greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions by net zero by 2050 or preferably earlier. So what levers does the city have to help our citizens to make changes with their emissions? I think that's, that's summing up the question. Um, I'm gonna, it looks like Harji's ready to answer this one. I can start and then Lisa or Lorraine, you can add to it. I think that um, this way the city is supporting is by starting with adding infrastructure, key infrastructure that's required to help advance um, some bold steps. So that would include items like the district energy, um, advancing um, even electrical vehicle infrastructure, uh, sustainable modes of transportation networks, greenways, and also the tree planting. So that is that is the kickstart from the city's perspective. Also adding uh, more electrical infrastructure includes like a substation so that there's enough capacity to take on um, everyone going electric. So that, that is also an, an area where the city has started to kick off on that. So more to come, but I think the advance, the first piece is just to make it a fair and equitable um, playing ground, the market and the city all have to catch up as well in terms of the advancement of infrastructure. And when it comes to even electrical vehicles, we can all see that there's only like one type or maybe largely one type and it's fairly expensive. So when that actually becomes equitable that we can all, that's a fair place where maybe other measures can be brought in. But at this time, taxing further or that that's not on the horizon for City of New Westminster at a regional level, I haven't heard anything either, but it could be in the future. Yeah, Lisa, and I'm gonna, add? yeah, no, I'm gonna add to that. Um, the first thing I'm, I'm also gonna, the first thing I'm gonna say, Karen is, uh, we, if you want, you can also write to us tomorrow or, or we'll get your email address because we also have um, um, corporate emissions plan. We actually have strategies around this as well that really lay out quite well some of the work that we're wanting to do. So um, happy to send you that, that information. I think one of the biggest things that we're really trying to do is change our, is, is, is help change our own behavior. And, and we, have a, a, we have a very strong commitment in the capital program around sustainable transportation at putting funding together for greenways in particular, all of that ways that really help all of us um, kind of remove our reliance to the, to the automobile, any other sort of fossil fuels. So there's a whole set of initiatives we're doing around that. We're a very walkable city that way. So we are happy to send you um, our, our information on that as well. I'm seeing in the uh, chat from Emiliano, I'm hoping I'm saying your name correctly, um, that he would like that information too. So uh, we can make note of that and maybe try to find a, a place to post it, maybe even on our budget 2022 Be Heard page. So um, I'll ask someone to take a note of, of that, what we've committed to share back, and we'll make sure that we do that. Um, Karen, I see your hand is up as well. I'm going to take a couple other questions from the, the Q&A box and then I'll, I'll come to you um, and ask you to, to ask your question live. Uh, so we've got a question here from Carmen next. Um, Carmen says, I've seen a lot of discarded PPE, mainly masks, on New West sidewalks and in our parks. This discarded PPE is environmentally unsustainable and is particularly harmful to wildlife. Does the city have any ideas or initiatives for dealing with this issue, which is probably only going to get worse? So litter and PPE in our parks and on our streets. It looks like Lisa's unmuting there. Um, this is the problem when we don't have all departments at these <laughs> at these events because there's probably some some staff that actually have the right answer here um i don't have the answer i promise that i will send this question to our engineering operations department as and our and our and our parks operations staff um and we will get you that answer so again to all of you when we don't have an answer and we only try our best here um i we make a commitment to actually get you the right information yeah, thanks for that, Lisa. And I think, yeah, I, I wanted to also share with the group that, you know, we've got our fine, a couple of our, our finance leaders here, and we've got Lisa here, um, but we don't have all departments on this call. So we, you know, we're hoping to focus in on financial and, and budget questions on this session. Doesn't mean your other questions are not welcome. Absolutely. Let us know what questions you have. 
um, but we will be somewhat limited in, in what we can share tonight just with not having um, uh, all of the departments on the line. Uh, so thank you for that question. All right, next question here from Shane. Are you able to give an update on when the new recycling depot is to open? Has the city reconsidered having a local recycling drop-off point? I, this might fall into the category of we need to we need to hear from someone from engineering. But um, any thoughts on this? Well, I, I do know I do know that engineering was um, has looked has looked at pop-up. Um, events and other facilities to, to address this. And again, engineering has a strategy around that. So Shane, my commitment, we will send you that information as well. I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I can also add to this that, um, you know, I would encourage community members to look up the return at depots. Um, so I used to go to the, the recycling depot by Canada Games Pool. Um, and now I've changed my habits to go to the return at depots. Um, there's one in Queensboro. There's one in uh, Saperton. There's one just across the bridge into Surrey, which is really near for me and my place in New West downtown. Um, and they take your refundables too. So it's like a one stop. They take most of the things that were at that uh, that were at the city's recycle depot plus your refundables. So it's not everything, but I've found those centers. If you just Google return it, uh, you can get a map and all the different locations where those are. And there's quite a few. There's one in Burnaby as well, just over the border. All right, next question here is from Emiliano. When you mention depreciation of assets, does that mean vehicles and such, or does that include roads and infrastructure wear and tear? So I mm -hmm. think this connects back to, we were talking about the operating budget and yep. that a portion of that goes towards depreciation of assets. That's correct. And this is Lorraine, I will take this one. Um, so thanks for the question, Emiliano. Um, the depreciation of assets does include uh, things like roads and infrastructure. So all of the assets that we uh, capitalize on our, our book or our statement, our financial statements, do get depreciated over time at different, um, through different time periods. So buildings will have a different rate than vehicles will, but it does include all assets, including things like sewer and water infrastructure. Great, thank you for that, Lorraine. All right, next question here is from Jan. Thanks for the question, Jan. I'm curious to learn more about how property taxes are assessed. For example, how does lot size play a factor? I've seen examples in other cities where for neighboring lots, same amenities, infrastructure, et cetera, the cost by area is cheaper for larger size lots. The example I gave seems like an unfair way to assess land. Harji, I think this is a, BC assessment question, but maybe you can help out here. Yeah, it's um, simply stated um, is, is the market. Um, so, you know, obviously when we have real estate location, uh, property size, uh, property age, everything that's happening in that real estate market around either the zone um, is going to influence the assessed value. So there's really... Um, that's really what it takes. And it could be a block over. And for some reason, the market is higher on the other block. So that's that's just, that's the part that we can't uh, control. So that's the market. Thanks, Harjun. All right, next question here is from Rena. Thanks for the question. Is the city budgeting for any climate mitigation strategies? How to deal with more extreme heat, rising sea and river levels, thinking about the Queensboro dikes, and water stress on vegetation, for example, cedar trees that can't survive the heat in the long term. What are we, how are we thinking about climate mitigation and budgeting for that? So similar to um, Lisa, I won't speak to what an engineer could specifically speak to of the specifics around the type of um, flood walls or mitigation strategies, but from a budgeting standpoint, from a resilient city, we are um, preparing for um, either through our reserves uh, and asset management strategies of where, where we uh, need to add that resilience and from a climate mitigation, anything from tree canopy, anything from greenhouse gas reductions and many bold steps we can take with the climate will actually support um, in that area. Greenest bank for our buck is kind of the, the key sentence that we're using today. So 
I'll also, I'll also add that we're doing quite a bit of work um, in our engineering departments and our building departments around uh, flood construction levels. So we 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 have been monitoring this and um, and it and it it has changed over time. So the so the engineering department is working on a robust dike strategy as well around that, looking at where we have vulnerabilities. I will also say that um, with the changes that we've been experiencing with extreme heat, um, we're actually in the we're actually doing a series of post mortems right now and and looking at other sort of hazards and vulnerabilities in the city. Some of that. Uh, is probably is going to find its way um, as part of the budget process. I think one that most people will, will also appreciate too from a vulnerability perspective is what was happening along the Fraser River and maybe the need for um, a fire boat and looking at some of vulnerabilities that way. So there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different staff that are, that are working on different components of this. And um, as the work gets done, we actually bring these all to, to council as well. So if this is the kind of information that is of interest to you, um, let us know. And we, we like to, we actually have no problem letting residents know when certain reports are going forward to council so that you're actually live to this, to this work. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, I'm gonna take one more question from the, the Q and A box, and then Karen, um, get ready because I'm going to come and and unmute you so that you can answer or so you can ask your question verbally. Um, Bereket has a question, and I hope I got your name right, Bereket. Thank you for putting EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, in the forefront. What does specific and measurable success look like for the EDI budgeting framework? I think we, Lisa gave a couple of examples of what our, our measures look like in that framework, but um, Lisa, did you want to add to, to this? Well, I probably, I'll, I'll use um, the one area that's probably one of the top priorities, affordable housing. So we're, we're looking at a, a series of uh, metrics right now around the, around the number of units that we're, that we're actually trying to secure with senior government funding and streamline the development, the construction process, so that they're so that they're actually going to be built and um, and aligned with some of the um, operating licenses through BC Housing. That's a specific one, and it's a and it's a top priority for us. So that it's not for us. Yes, all housing is important. Affordable housing is important, but. Housing that um, requires deep subsidy or affordable housing is in our face for us is like the top priority and where we're actually trying to prioritize some of the work we're doing around the affordable housing portfolio. Thanks for that, Lisa. I think um, so. I, I sit on a committee about a staff city staff committee about. Um, key performance in indicators for this area. Uh, we have put forward a report to council on this and it has gone, um, so that is out in the public realm. So that's something that we can add to our list of things to report back to you on um, so that you don't have to try and find that yourself in, in all of the many council reports that we have out there. Um, but that is something that, uh, that we are working on, key performance indicators in the area of equity. Um, and we have reported to council on that. All right, so Karen, I am going to unmute you and ask you to jump in here and briefly let us know your question. Thank you, can you hear me? We can. Great, um, so I just wanted to clarify my question because I think what I typed in wasn't very clear. Um, my question was more about what strategies the city might have to change people's values or thoughts about the climate emergency so that climate action becomes priority one for spending in the public eye. Right now, I think, for example, priority one from the surveys you have done is infrastructure, for example. And so I'm just wondering if you've given any thought to, um, and I'm sure you have, uh, how do we, you know, kind of bring more and more people on to the realities of the situation we're facing with the climate emergency so that they will prioritize and give you social license to prioritize climate um, spending as number one. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Karen, and that question. Yeah, I think it's a um, maybe a, a, not a quick, short answer, but um, any thoughts from our panel on this? 
Fair enough. I mean, ahead, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a behavioral question and, um, and there's several initiatives that I know um, that various staff are doing around public awareness in particular, right? And, and, and initiatives that, that really tie pe some of people's actions also to, to um, other decisions like congestion pricing, all, all those other initiatives that all work, the climate, climate emergency. And I, and I know that I'm doing an absolute disservice to this answer. So Karen, you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm gonna make sure I align you with the, I, I link you up with the right staff that are actually doing a lot of work on this. Thanks, Hardy. Did you want to add something there? No, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Karen. Appreciate the question. Um, next question here is from Rena. Is the city planning on using more electric micro, micro mobility for its fleet? Electric cars being heavy require a lot of electricity to run far, far more than electric bikes, trikes, and golf carts. So for the city fleet, are we looking at micro mobility? I can start on that one oh, if you would like. Um, so we thank you, uh, Rena, for the question. <clears throat> the city already has begun this journey, and we do have a so far small fleet of electric bikes uh, for uh, shared use within the city. Um, and um, there is a move or a desire to, of course, uh, increase that. Um, they were introduced, I think, two years ago, and uh, were in immediately very popular, but. Um, we are looking at that, those types of things. And um, yes, a very good suggestion. And we do have some smaller uh, vehicles that we use in our facility or our parks maintenance. And that's an area that can be examined as well. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move on so that we can get to a few more questions before our hour is up. Emiliano asks, in the transportation area for the budget, what traffic calming initiatives are intended for the city? Will it be spread through all major areas or focusing on uptown and downtown? Traffic calming initiatives. Well, I mean, the, we've been working on traffic calming um, for years in the, in the city. Um, so I think, I think most people know that through traffic is a real challenge here. And the engineering department has always come up with sort of traffic calming initiatives um, in some of our key areas. Recently, there's been a lot of work around our RCH. So no, is it just focused on uptown and downtown? No, there's a, there's a considerable work that the engineering department is also doing in and around Saberton and um, the RCH as well. So if you and so if you'd like to sort of see some of the breakdown in um in the engineering budget, again, we can send you that information as well. Perfect, thanks. And Emiliano had a follow-up here or a, an earlier question as well. What does the new district energy refer to? So if we could explain that briefly as well, the district energy. I can start on that. And then Lisa, if you want to jump in, new district energy, largely in um, new developments. So, you know, if it's a Saberton area, it's using renewable energy, which is simply underground uh, heat and to, to warm up the buildings instead of gas. So it's a real uh, bold step towards climate action, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Great. Thank you, awesome. All right, uh, we've got a couple more questions. Hopefully we can get to them all. Trudy asks, could you highlight where police services is in the budget? Understanding that union contracts have dictated raises in wages year over year, what other ways are we minimizing increases in this expense? So in police budget in particular. Um, I'll take a crack at it. So um, Trudy, thanks for the question. If um, uh, if you were to want to participate more in some information on specific budgets or take a look at council reports in our budget documents, our final five-year plan budget document for the operating police services is a line item that's disclosed in, um, in those reports. Um, and it's also a line item in our annual reports. And the second part of the question might be union contracts. What are we, um, 
how are we minimizing increases in this expense given that uh, raises are uh, dictated in the, in the union contracts? I can take a stab at it, Lorraine. So it, specifically it's, go ahead, sorry. sorry. No. As, so basically the annual budget, it's the prop, the police budget is largely funded, is funded from the property tax, it's not the utility rates. And when looking at the property tax funded um, items, it would include fire, police, library, parks, and general government services, and then asset depreciation. How to mitigate, so when there's, agreements and contracts in place. Uh, various strategies are used across the city to um, come in with efficiencies or other transformational projects that help mitigate an, increment, an increase beyond inflation. Last year, you will notice in our budget, if you have, if you have a moment to look into it, is um, the 4.9% is actually a couple of percent towards debt financing for a new um, capital project, Canada Games. And the balance of it, uh, fixed cost was only a couple of percent. And so the rest of the enhancements and service requests that were required um, from departments were offset with efficiencies in other areas. Great, thanks for that, Harji. Um, Donna, I'm gonna come back to your question, um, but I want to quickly let everyone on the, know, oh, on the call know about our next steps. So we're also gonna ask you how this session was for you. We're gonna bring up the, the evaluation poll, please, Zaria. Um, and while you're answering that poll, and this one also has two questions as well, so please make sure you scroll down. I'm gonna let you know about our next steps and opportunities for you to provide input into the budget. So we have launched our uh, budget 2022 survey. It's on our beherdnewwest.ca budget 2022 page. The link is there on the, the screen. You most likely came across that page um, in learning about the webinar, so hopefully you're familiar with it. Um, you, as our budget process moves on, you're also welcome to watch council budget workshops and various meetings where the budget will be discussed. You can sign up to speak directly to council at some of our meetings. It's uh, the first meeting of every month. So for we're working on the budget through to the end of the year. So you can sign up to speak to council. You can also send your input directly into finance and that email address is nwfinance at newwestcity.ca. It is also listed as well on the Be Heard page. We'll ask you to please share this information with your neighbors. Let your neighbors know that we're doing a budget survey and that we're in the budget process and, and encourage them to also get involved. Uh, we will also take, um, we've seen some of your comments and feedback in the chat tonight. We will make sure that we, we record that and, and share it out with the staff teams. Um, next step, so that survey that we've just launched this evening is open until October 5th, so it's open for three weeks. Then we'll move into reporting back to you and to council and staff about the results of that survey. Those uh, workshops with council will take place in October and November, and we will release the draft budget in November. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, it is right on seven o'clock. Um, I will um, pose your question, Donna, to the panel, but for those of you who need to go right at seven, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you coming and your uh, thoughtful questions and your participation and your attention tonight. So thank you, everyone. Please connect with us on Be Heard. We will um, share back some of those uh, reports and different studies and things that were referenced, uh, referenced here and that you asked about. Um, all right, so last question here for Donna. I think this is a big question, but we can try and take, take a crack at it. Can you please define what affordable housing is as it relates to New West? With densification realities and pressures on housing, what level of population growth, specifically in New West, does the city speculate is enough or too much before New West is stretched thin as a livable city with infrastructure and budget constraint, constraints? At one point, is more not better for New West? So a few questions embedded in there. Um, I will turn it over to our panel. Oh, I'll, I'll start. So um, Donna, thank you for the question. So I used to be the Director of Development Services. So I was the planner for years as well. And um, we're guided by A, our official community plan where we outline our, first of all, our growth targets, and then in particular, our housing growth targets for the city over the next 10, 20, 30, and also now 50 years. So 
that that's the first thing that actually articulates um, how much housing in general but over the years and with the need for affordable housing we're now tracking and setting targets for affordable housing and those targets are in two places one they are in the city's official community plan but the second place is in metro metro vancouver's um, livable plan as well and that's because of the need for affordable housing in the region one of the other reasons why we're now creating targets for affordable housing has to do more with low income and supportive housing um, and homelessness housing and this need to start um, really identifying that those that are harder to house those requiring greater level of subsidies that we all have an obligation and a commitment to to find more housing solutions so that's actually how we target and look at the amount when we when we're when we look at how much um, and is it too much how does that mean with infrastructure and budget constraints the reason why we have it in the official community plan is our way of, of showing transparency of growth in this case housing and and services in the in this in the city looking at things like water water services sewer services all the other services is tied to our growth strategies when is it too much um i'll be honest with you that that's a that's a judgment call that has more to do with um our standard of living do we feel that we're still providing sufficient services are are the communities most vulnerable do they have same access to services it's 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 a it's a qualitative answer to that and so it's difficult for me to answer that one but i can speak to more of the, the quantitative part is is articulated in our official community plan I think Lisa, I could add to just uh, one portion of the, the indicator too, is we do track um, the demand. So within our city, uh, for example, if it's affordable or supportive housing, it's like how much um, demand is there for the housing. So homelessness activity or, or counts are, are looked at in terms of how much is too much would be like if, a, if, if we exceed what our demand is. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Donna. The questions, Donna. Um, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm not seeing any outstanding questions and we are a couple minutes over our scheduled time. So again, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on Be Heard and, uh, and on email. Please feel free to reach out to us um, with any other questions that you may think of and have a great evening. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.